The cure is seen tied to a guillotine, awaiting his death as two bloodhound guards stood by his sides holding their swords up high. The cure wore an expressionless face as he thinks about his final moments. But even in his final moments, his eyes were filled with an intense red glow as he stares at something in front of him. Hugo was standing proud and tall as the moonlight casts light on him, as a platoon of bloodhounds stood behind him. Hugo slowly raises his hand in the air while his eyes glowed bright red in the night. His eyes released an intense glow and glare as he pushes his hand in a downward motion. The sound of a sharp blade meeting flesh and bone was heard in the night as blood was seen splattered in the sky. The Kier's vision of Hugo and the others were now at a low viewpoint as everything started to look hazy. Blood soon filled his vision as he looks at the numerous red stares from his once former family members. Hugo slowly walks away from the cure as his vision was almost filled with blood. But his eyes were still focused on Hugo's head as he left the cure alone. Hugo so in the end you, muttered the cure as his vision fades to black. The cure then slowly opens his eyes after awakening from his dream. He stares at the ceiling and saw that he was in some sort of cottage. Bandages covered his face and body as he lay on a bed made of something while his neck was tied to a rope, he wonders what this place is. He thinks about how he didn't know how many days had passed, or how he had survived the battle against Madame Eight Legs. He recalls back to the moment when he had unleashed his most powerful attack on Madame Eight Leg, realizing that during that crucial moment, if Madame hadn't stopped in her tracks upon receiving a shock from the explosion's light, the cure would have lost his life. The cure slowly sits upright while holding his injured shoulder, he thinks about how his muscles' veins, and even bones were all injured there wasn't a place in his body where he felt uninjured, the cure didn't think this would be the extent of his injuries after receiving a hit head-on, he realizes that he had misjudged Madame's attack power so bad that he could even feel it in his bones. The cure then holds onto the rope around his neck, wondering if it was because of this that caused him to have a neck ache that he was feeling now after the battle against Madame, but it was because of it that he was saved. The cure started to think about the others, and wondered if he could consider it as going according to plan, his plan of escaping Hugo's watch was a success as, besides Adolf and Camus, many other witnesses could prove his death, allowing the cure to not worry about his death being proven. The cure exits the cottage tent and notices something. He sees barbarians of different ages and genders walking around. He recognizes it as the Balak's camp called Bulak, and he wonders if he was being held captive in their camp. The Kier thinks about how he was in the midst of the camp that belongs to the natural enemies of the Baskerville clan, which was bad for him as he couldn't run away with his ruined body. A voice shouts out saying hurry up. Walk, just as a group of prisoners appeared behind the Kier with their hands bound together. A female barbarian was holding the rope attached to four of the men's necks as prisoners while shouting at them that if they don't move quickly they would die from the wolf's bite. The cure watches them from a distance and was surprised as he recognizes their faces as people who were soldiers from the Baskerville and Morgue clans. He watches them leave thinking about why he was not being executed, a foot appears behind him saying that he was up. The cure looks back and sees a punk rock hairstyle barbarian male asking him if he could speak Balak. The cure recognizes the barbarian as Ahun, the barbarian holding the dart blower who tried to attack him from the bushes a few days ago. Ahun tells Vakir that he should be thankful that he wasn't going to end up with the same fate as the prisoners he had just seen. Ahun then smirks right in the face of Vakir's, asking him how he felt watching his comrades walk towards their death, and that he must be in despair since he could not do anything with that crippled body. With an evil smile on his face, Ahun tells Vakir that if he weren't the commander's pet dog, he would have boiled Vakir right away. Hearing the words pet dog triggered something deep within Vakir's soul. He visualizes Hugo's face with his hands filled with chains and a dark aura. The chains were slowly suffocating the cure as his body was slowly being covered by the chains and dark aura. Ahun suddenly felt an immense pressure wondering what it was. He looks at the cure and sees that his eyes were filled with murderous intent and that his hockey was extremely strong, one piece reference. Ahu responded with a punch to the cure's face calling him an arrogant bastard. The punch left the cure on the ground trembling slightly as he didn't respond back. Ahun leaves him alone telling the cure that he should stop standing there and go find his owner who was at the end of the rope. The cure slowly got up and looked at Ahun walking away, 
his eyes were filled with revenge as he had memorized Ahan's face and swore to get his revenge once his body recovers. The Kir walks past a few more cottage tents in the camp. He slowly pulls onto the rope inch by inch as he made his way out of the camp wondering how the rope was this long. He walks a bit further but soon notices that he had walked quite a fair bit but still couldn't see the end of the rope, which causes him to wonder if his owner was actually at the end of the rope. All of a sudden the rope tightens itself. The Kir notices that the rope was being pulled in a certain direction. He sees that the end of the rope was leading into a pool of water, where Ian was seen submerged inside. She was holding onto the end of the rope but remained silent. The Kir and Ian were soon entering an awkward staring contest with one another, as the Kir stood on land while Ian was submerged in the waters. She gives him a wide smile before telling him to lie down. The Kir was suddenly pulled forward by her. As his head was pulled forward by Ian a certain object went through the spot where his head was originally. An arrow lands on a tree. Ian came out of the water and shouted at a group of children calling them brats and telling them to go practice somewhere else. Meanwhile, the Kir was just laying on the ground motionless. Ian then turns to him to thank him for setting her free at the slave auction. She points a finger at the Kir, telling him that she was the kind to return kindness twofold while returning tenfold when it comes to revenge, and since he had saved her once before, she had now saved him twice. The Kir wondered where the twice came from. She explains to him that she had gone back for him after his fight with Madame Eight Legs, and if she didn't do that he would have died, so he needed to be thankful that she was tenacious. The Kir then asks her if she was the one who had set up the rope attached to his neck. But Ian simply smiled at him as he asks her another question about the reason why she was keeping him alive. The rope tightens around his neck which catches the Kir's attention while Ian informs him that she noticed that the Kir seemed to be in a high position within his party. While pulling his rope Ian tells him how she wonders how much his party would pay for him. The Kir starts to grow nervous as he thought that he was in trouble, he knew that if the barbarians started hostage negotiations with the Baskerville clan, his original plan of escaping Hugo's watch would have become meaningless. He thinks deeply about what he should do in this situation. Ian flashes a smile and chuckles. She asks the Kir about what he was thinking and if he had felt a sense of hope. But CK! Ian tells Vakir that unfortunately, he wasn't going back to his party as she pulls him closer while slowly taking out a blade from her thick juicy thigh. She cuts the long rope while telling Vakir that he was going to be her slave, lucky man, but Vakir was actually glad to hear that. Ian then points her blade towards Vakir telling him that they should decide on their titles first and that Vakir should call her master, sorry lady but our hero ain't a beta is a goddamn alpha am I right viewers? But Vakir doesn't respond at all and just remains silent like a giga chad. Ian laughs and tells him that she liked his rebellious eyes and that it would be fun taming him. Ian then sheets her blade back into its cover on her thigh. She looks forward and tells Vicar that before they get into the taming, they had to go somewhere else first. Vakir then asks her where they were going. Ian smiles happily as the sunlight brightens her face, she tells Vakir that it was obvious. The Kir had to give his greetings when he stepped into someone else's land, a cottage tent is seen with skulls hung around and on top of it. An arrow is pierced through the thick skull of a dead crocodile. Ian informs via Kir that they will be visiting the village head which is the matriarch, just as a fierce mommy-looking barbarian woman is seen sitting on top and around the dead bodies of animals who had their skulls pierced by a single arrow. The Kir and Ian were now walking back through the camp of the Balaks together. A. Ian explains to Vakir that if he didn't have a place to sleep, you could just sleep under friend's hammock, and if he was ever hungry, he could get food from someone who was more affluent. Ian tells him that this was how the Baloks were living as. She turns to Vakir and informs him that their way of life may mean nothing to outsiders, but to the people who lived here it was a very homely place, and that it would be good for Vakir to get used to their way of living. But Vakir commented that he noticed that the Baloks had no regard for private assets. Aion then informs Vakir that they had arrived at the matriarch's house, which was the cottage tent covered with skulls shown before. Ian entered the house first and informs her mother that they were here. As Vakir entered the house he catches the word mother. Ian's mother stood up saying you're here. She takes note that Ian had brought back the empirical boy that she was talking about every day, 
hearing this made Ayan fluster as she tells her mother that she didn't talk about via Kir every day. The Kir connected the dots in his head after seeing that Ayan was the matriarch's daughter of the Balak tribe. Which might be that her mother was the Night Fox. The Night Fox was the female Balak warrior who had scarred Hugo's nose bridge, and was the reason behind why the Kir could not cross the La Rouge et Lenoir Mountains landscape. The Kir thinks about his past self and wondered what would happen to his past version if he had gone up against her. He started to experiment in his head about his chances if he were to fight her in head-on combat which ended up in 0%. He then thought of his chances of winning if he went through the assassination route but realized that it was still at 0%. The Kir gulps nervously as a sweat drop drips down from his face after imaging those situations in his head. Seeing the Night Fox's intense deadly aura up close made him realize that if he had run away, his chances were only a mere 20% but the 20% would only be referring to his survival rate. The Night Fox takes a look at the Kir's face and tells him that he had seen his face before. The Kir wondered nervously if she had realized that he was from the same bloodline as Hugo by instinct, but the Night Fox brushes it off by saying that most Imperial men look the same. She asks Ayan about what she was planning on doing to the Kir as he was no different from a cripple but Ian tells her that Vakir would be useful once he receives good treatment as he was the one who attacked Madame Eight Legs after all. But her mother warns her that taking action without knowing your place might come back to bite you. The Night Fox brushes off Ian's initial intentions as it didn't matter to her whether Vakir's body was destroyed or not, she only cared about whether his seed was fine, Ian became flustered and told her mother that it was not about that. The Kir begins to inspect certain objects in the house while the mother and daughter continued to argue. Ayan tells her mother that she was going to use Vakir was a slave, but her mother was surprised to hear that as she was talking about doing something else to Vakir, before her mother could complete her sentence, Ayan yells at her that she just needed Vakir as a slave to support her during hunts. Night Fox soon pats Ayan's head which causes her to blush as she tells her that it is up to the owner to do what they want to do with their slave. Ayan then takes a peek, and sees Vakir checking out the main pillar of the house. They soon left the house and went to walk back to the forest. As they walk together Vakir tells Ayan that he had a question. He asks her what her name was, causing Ayan to yell at him about suddenly asking a question all of a sudden and how he dared to ask questions as a slave. But Vakir informs her that he does not intend to call her his master which was why he asked what her name was. Ayan rubs her head before telling Vakir that her name was Ayan. Vakir then introduces himself as Vakir and asks her what she wanted him to do by her name. Ayan was flustered at Vakir calling her by her name and told him how dare a slave call her by her name. She then decides to give Vakir his first order. Ayan points her finger at her and shouts out that his first order was to build a house, a house that he will be living in from now on. Ayan thinks mischievously about how Vakir was acting too arrogant as a slave and that there was no way an imperial bastard like him would know how to build a house. She continues to think that ordering a slave around was part of a master's competency and that she needed to use this chance to rebalance the hierarchy between them, meanwhile, Vakir was thinking about the first order of building a house. He smiles and says that this was going to be fun. After some time we see Ayan standing still with her hands behind her back wearing a stunned expression on her face. The Kir points to a makeshift tent and tells her that he had carried out her order. She looks at the tent that the Kir built and wondered why he was so good at building tents, she thought that he would have struggled to build a house because of his injured body. Ian turns around to look at the building materials that she brought over, she thinks that since he managed to build the house, there was no use for the items that she had brought with her. The Kir was happy with the house he built as he thought that it had been a while. He recalls his past memories during the time of destruction when swordsmen were only good at wielding swords which was why they couldn't survive. So in order to survive in extreme situations, one would need to learn a variety of survival skills. Ayan inspects the drains that Vakir had dug out and commented that they were perfect too. Vakir informs her that the matriarch's tent looked unstable, this catches Ayan's attention as it was about her mother. Vakir explained to her in detail in regards to her mother's tent problem stating that in its current state, during the rainy seasons the ground around the central pillar will shake which might cause water to leak through, if she orders him to, Vakir was willing to mix limey dirt and gravel on the opposite hill to create bricks, which he will reinforce the bricks by spreading oil and burning it. 
Hearing the long explanation made I and order Vakir to do what he said as she was thinking the same thing. Vakir then went on to gather the materials to create the bricks as Ai and watched him from behind a tree. He then started to roast the brick mixture to form the actual bricks while I and watched closely by his side. They soon met up with the matriarch once again, with Vakir carrying a wagon filled with the bricks he had made. Night Fox was surprised to learn about her house problems from them. After a while Vakir had created a solution made up of bricks to help resolve the issues the matriarch's house was having. The matriarch tells them that she was frustrated because of the numerous amount of time she had tried to repair the roof, water would still be leaked through, she now realizes that the main problem was the main pillar. She tells Vakir that he had done a good job while informing her daughter that she had picked up quite a useful mail. She then instructs Vakir to go around the barracks to take care of tedious matters such as this. Ian remains silent while looking concerned at Vakir nods his head upon hearing her mother's command. Vakir was seen washing the rags at a nearby river when Ian calls out to him, catching his attention. She asks him if it was exhausting to just slave away and wonders if he wants to be an official member of their tribe. Vakir continues to wash the rags while answering her that slaving away wasn't too bad. He thinks about how it was much more peaceful being a slave here than being part of the Baskervilles or living in the underdog city. Ayan was surprised to hear that kind of reply from Vakir, she stated that from the way Vakir spoke he had been disciplined well, and that from a slave's perspective, it would be hard to complain, Vakir continued to tell her that it really was not that bad, Ayan the reply saying there was no way it wasn't when he was doing tough and tedious work. Vakir ignores her and continues to do his work, Ayan follows behind him and tells him to not be silent and to follow her, as she would be able to help him in terms of surviving and adjusting in the Balak's tribe. Ayan informs him that if he does a good job, she will remove the rope around his neck, this offer catches Vakir's attention and he turns around to tell her that that offer sounded appealing. He then asks her about what he should do, Ayan smiles and tells him that he was now being honest. She tells Vakir that he needed to go on a hunt and capture a huge prey. She explained that the tribe's warriors haven't been able to catch prey large enough, making the growing children unable to eat meat for a while. In other words, Vakir needed to bring in a huge prey so that changing his title from slave to commoner wouldn't be a pipe dream. Ayan then smacks the back of Vakir's heart causing him to flinch. With a smile on her face she tells Vakir that he had no problem moving light objects and that all he needed to do was just assist her. Vakir was showing an annoyed expression after being smacked on the back just as Ayan tells him about how lucky he was to be the slave of the Balak's hunting commander. Vakir thought about the job of hunting for a moment and then agreed to join Ayan in hunting. Hearing this brought joy to Ayan as she smiles widely while blushing a bit. She tells Vakir that they would be leaving tomorrow but Vakir was curious about why she was smiling like that, Ayan tells him she wasn't just as a foot appears behind a tree. Ahun was glaring angrily upon hearing the conversation between Ayan and Vakir. He sees how close Vakir was getting to Ayan and calls him a disgusting bastard, jelly much? Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.